Do you swear fealty? Do you bend the knee? Where are my dragons? Oh, there you are. Well, good day to you, my lords and ladies, and welcome back to Love English. Now guys, as you may have guessed, I am a huge fan of Game of Thrones, and so today we're going to look at essential vocabulary for understanding Game of Thrones. Now Game of Thrones has been a hit all over the world, but I wonder how many of you are actually watching it in English, or maybe you want to read the books, but you're thinking it might be too difficult. Now a lot of the language in Game of Thrones is a little bit old-fashioned and complex, so today we're going to be looking at 20 essential words that you need to understand the sensation and scary but incredible ride that is a Game of Thrones. Go away! Before we get started guys, I do have a little spoiler alert for you, and that is that while I'm actually explaining this vocabulary, I am going to be referring back to events that have already happened in the story. So if you haven't seen Game of Thrones and you want to see it, then don't watch this video. Watch this video after. <gasps> the new season of Game of Thrones is coming out. I don't have any spoilers for that, so don't worry about that at all. But I am very, very excited. The final season, oh! Don't forget guys, if you haven't already, to subscribe and click that lovely notification notification bell. If you don't, I'll set my dragons on you. Okay guys, so number one. Number one is revenge. Revenge, which is of course a noun. It's probably the most important word in Game of Thrones as basically it describes the whole series. Revenge is where you get back at somebody for something that they have done to you. So for example, now Arya Stark wants to avenge, which is the verb, she wants to get revenge for her father's killing, for the murder of her father, Ned Stark. So she wants to avenge this. So verb, avenge, noun, revenge. Number two is backstabbing. Backstabbing. Backstabbing is just all over Game of Thrones. A character will appear to be loyal to one character and then will later uh, tell their secret or have them murdered or, or have them tortured, all sorts of horrible things like this. So to stab someone in the back is the idiom and this means that you don't expect for them to be disloyal to you, you actually trust them but then they turn around and they break your trust and they stab you in the back. Not necessarily literally, although in Game of Thrones it is very often literally. There's a, a lot of death and killing in Game of Thrones. Number three is ruthless ruthless. If someone is ruthless, they don't really show compassion or pity for others. They are a very hard or harsh person who doesn't usually show weakness. So if you say a king was ruthless, it meant maybe that he had a very strong rule, but that there was a lot of people who suffered because of that, because he wasn't particularly forgiving, and he definitely wasn't merciful. If you don't understand what mercy means, that's coming next. Well, a character that I would describe as ruthless in Game of Thrones is Cersei Lannister. So number four is to show mercy, to show mercy. And this is where you do let somebody off the hook or you do forgive them, even when you could actually punish them or you have the right to punish them you are in some way forgiving, so you aren't ruthless. It's really the opposite of ruthless. My favourite, of course, the Khaleesi, she does show mercy. At different times when she could punish people, she's merciful and she doesn't do her worst. That's why she rocks and hopefully she'll be on the Iron Throne. Tell them you live by the grace of Her Majesty. Number five is to swear fealty. This is very old fashioned and we don't actually really say it anymore, but we will understand it. And basically, it is when you swear loyalty to someone, usually a king or your lord or someone like that. You swear your loyalty to them, so you promise that you will be pledged, really, to them. As in, whatever they wish you to do, you will remain loyal. So in this scene here, Daenerys is asking Jon Snow to swear fealty, to bend the knee, meaning accept I'm your queen and be loyal to me. Torrin Stark swore fealty to House Targaryen in perpetuity. Number six is an oath, an oath. And this is really a promise. So for example, in many Western courts of law, you are required to swear an oath on the Bible before you speak. So if you give information, they will say, you need to swear an oath on the Bible that what you say is only the truth. 
So it's a very serious promise and oath. If you swear an oath to somebody, you're promising yourself to them, really. Kind of like to swear fealty. So if you swear an oath of loyalty, you're saying, I promise I will remain loyal to you. Do you swear on the Constitution of the United States to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Ain't no thing. Number seven is allies and allegiance. If there is one thing that you need in Game of Thrones, it is allies. Now, allies are not exactly friends. They're a group of people or a group of countries that have agreed to cooperate with each other because they are stronger together. They have said, we're in this situation, and so we're going to make sure that we are allied, as in we're going to work together because we're stronger together. So, for example, in the Second World War, England and France and America, as well as other countries, were allies. They were cooperating and working together. Number eight is a wildling. So a wildling is called a wildling because they are uncultivated and untamed. For example, if we say that you've let your garden go wild, it means you haven't cultivated it. The grass has grown very high and nature has really taken over. So to be wild means to be uncultivated, in a sense, to be free, actually. So for example, a wild animal isn't a pet, it's not been tamed. So that's why the wildlings are called the wildlings, because they refuse to conform to normal society. They wish to be free. Number nine is a maester. A maester. This is the old English version of master. A master. So basically, the maesters are called maesters because of their scientific and intellectual knowledge. So it's the same way that we use master today. They have been mastering all of their knowledge. They've been studying so much that they can be considered a master of it. So today, we use to master something as a verb, meaning to really accomplish it completely. So if you've mastered English, this means that you can speak English perfectly. People are usually a master of something. We can also say this phrase, to master the art of. For example, to master the art of being fashionably late or to master the art of cooking. I've done the first one, not the latter. Number 10 is to slay, to slay. This is an old fashioned English word which actually has kind of come back into fashion lately. Basically, to slay means to kill or to destroy something. For example, in fairy tales you might read, and the prince slew the dragon. <laughs> so, slew is the past of slay, but actually today you'll often hear slayed. Now I mention this word guys because obviously there is a lot of slaying in Game of Thrones, but also Jamie Lannister is known as the Kingslayer. This is because he killed the mad Targaryen king. However today, if you hear the word slay, it can also be that something is really cool or something is really amazing. Like if you say, oh this song slays, you mean it's, it's amazing, it's awesome. Number 11, unsullied. This is a word that we still do use in English. And if something is unsullied, it means it is not spoiled, it is still pure, it hasn't been made imperfect in any way. The verb to sully means to, to ruin or to make something dirty, to take away its purity, for example. So the unsullied are called the unsullied because they haven't actually been allowed to have any sexual relations. Essentially, they've been trained just to be perfect soldiers with no distractions. Not a very pleasant way to live, I'm sure. So you could say, their perfectly clean new house was sullied by the house party. Number 12 is superstitious. Superstitious. This is an adjective and the noun is superstition. There's a lot of superstition in Game of Thrones. And rightly so, as there are a lot of things to be superstitious about. Basically, superstition is where you believe in something that is not necessarily logical or not really proved. For example, if you won't leave your car until the black cat has gone, you're superstitious. And this is, for example, when we say something bad that hasn't happened yet, like, for example, oh, I haven't been ill yet, or I haven't caught the cold yet, and then we would say, touch wood. And we need to find wood to touch. So by touching the wood, we're kind of stopping the bad thing from happening. We're saying, okay, I better not be too sure about this, I better not be too arrogant, so I'll touch wood to make sure it doesn't happen. What superstitions do you have in your country? Please do comment below and tell me. They're very, very interesting. Number 13 is eerie. 
eerie. And this means a place that gives you a funny feeling or feels mysterious or scary in some way. If you say the atmosphere in the forest is eerie, you feel that there's something that you can't trust in the forest. You feel there's something a little bit spooky, we might also say. So a bit scary and giving you a spooky feeling or a creepy feeling. Number 14 is a trial by combat. Combat is where people are actually attacking each other or fighting in some way. So a trial by combat is where two people decide to fight each other in order to decide who is right in the situation. Maybe there are no witnesses and things like that, so they decide the best way to find out who is the one that is in the wrong is a trial by combat. So for example, Tyrion Lannister requests a trial by combat and he gets Bronn to fight for him. If you remember guys, Bronn wins the fight and therefore Tyrion is released. He's declared to be the winner and he cannot be punished. Number 15 is very similar. It's a duel, a duel. And a duel is a fight between two people. Traditionally, this has always been with swords. And this is where two people decide that they're going to compete against each other in a fight. Usually it's for some kind of reward. So either not to die or to get the princess or to get a prize of some kind. Next one guys is a warden, a warden. For example, Ned Stark was warden of the North, warden of Winterfell. And this means like a guardian, a person who looks after a particular thing. So for example, you can have a prison warden, a person who looks after the prison. It's their responsibility to care for it. And you could also have a warden of a nature reserve and things like that. Number 17 is a rather depressing one. It is to be doomed. Now, if you are doomed, it is certain that whatever you're doing or you yourself are not going to have a happy ending. In some way, something bad is going to happen. So for example, the poor princess Shireen, she was doomed because unfortunately her father was pretty crazy. All he wanted was the Iron Throne. So he sacrificed poor little Shireen. Oh, that was so, so horrible. So basically she was doomed. Number 18, again, super common word in Game of Thrones. And this is a traitor, a traitor. A traitor is somebody who in a big way has betrayed someone or has stabbed them in the back. So basically it's the person that betrays another that can be called a traitor. However, we will of course still use this word today to describe somebody who we thought was going to be loyal to us and who suddenly appears not to be loyal to us. And as a joke, we might say, oh, you traitor, you should be loyal to me. So in Game of Thrones, Ned Stark, if you remember, was accused of being a traitor and that was why he had his head cut off. So number 19 is treason. So this is very related to being a traitor. So treason is the name of the crime for plotting against the government or the king. So basically it's the crime of betraying one's country, trying to overthrow or bring about the downfall of the king or the government. So you are then called a traitor, but the actual name of the crime is treason. You stand accused of murder. You stand accused of treason. Number 20, slightly more positive one, and this is to surrender. Usually we use this word to say when we, for example, accept defeat. So if we say, okay, you're the winner, I'm the loser, I can't win against you, so I will surrender. Okay guys, I really hope this lesson was useful and that it encourages you to watch Game of Thrones in English. Of course, you can watch it with the subtitles on, or maybe even to read some of the books if you're a big Game of Thrones fan. You can get them downloaded to a Kindle and things like that. Please comment below and tell me your favourite characters from Game of Thrones and also your predictions for what's going to happen in this final season. Also guys, I have a little bit of homework for you to do. I have a final word which I could definitely apply to Game of Thrones, but I'm not going to tell you the meaning. I want you to find it out. So it's my favourite word. Please comment below and tell me what you have found out it means. It is skullduggery. Skullduggery. In Game of Thrones, there is a lot of skullduggery. So it's your challenge, guys, to find out what it means and comment below and even use it in a sentence. That's all from us today, guys, and take care out there because winter is coming.